I'd like to welcome everybody to today's ASA Travel Tuesday lecture. And it's now my very great pleasure to introduce to you Tony O'Connor. Tony is a noted archaeologist and a museum professional. He did his honours degree in ancient history and also in archaeology. And Tony has worked extensively on major North African sites, particularly in Libya. He's worked at Roman villas, military sites, and a great range of different places. And as a result of all of that, he has a very deep knowledge of the archaeology and the history of ancient regions. Tony is uh, leading three tours in 2024, so next year, lots to look forward to. He's got a tour to Roman Algeria that will be in April, May of next year. He's got his Adriatic journey in September, a tour I'd absolutely love to join you on, Tony. And then one in Tunisia, another very fascinating part of the world, which will be in October to November next year. But this evening, Tony is going to be talking to us about Croatia, archaeology and culture between Rome and Constantinople. So would you please welcome Tony O'Connor. Thanks, Tony. Over to you. Many, many thanks, Susanna, uh, for that introduction. And it's absolutely lovely to be given this opportunity to give this uh, talk to you on the wonderful archaeological and cultural offer that Croatia uh, has for visitors to the country. Having recently just led a ASA tour there, it is an absolutely astounding uh, country to visit and just so, so rewarding. So the subject of the talk, archaeology and culture between Rome and Constantinople, is looking at the story of Croatia in the period of time from its initial contact with the Roman Empire and then leading through to the medieval period and the changes between then the contacts uh, that Croatia has uh, with the Eastern Roman Empire uh, based in Constantinople and then the succeeding periods under the Venetians and the Ottomans as well will be briefly uh, touched on. The initial slide that I've got for you here shows an image from Salona and Salona was the capital of the province of Dalmatia. It originated as an Illyrian uh, city. These were the people who were in uh, the area of what's now Croatia uh, back in the Iron Age, so from the certainly the 8th century BC onwards, and by the 1st century BC it had become uh, a major Roman colony and the capital of the province uh, of Illyria initially and then Dalmatia uh, later on. The image there shows the personification of the city of Salona, which decorated one of the main gates leading into uh, the city. The image um, shows this uh, female uh, with a turreted headdress on, and that links to her role as being the personification of the city itself. So a welcome into Salona and a welcome to this talk on the contacts between Croatia and the Roman Empire in its various guises. To start with, looking at the position of Croatia in the geography of the Mediterranean and European uh, landscapes that it occupies, Croatia uh, lies on the eastern side of the Adriatic, the great sea that connects into the Mediterranean um, and which separates Italy from the western Balkan Peninsula, which extends all the way down from the Danube area in the north uh, down to Greece in the south. The Balkan Peninsula itself is uh, a very rugged uh, area, very mountainous, and with large major river valleys 
uh, cutting through it as well. At the north, over towards the area of the Danube, it is dominated by the great Pannonian Basin, uh, which is uh, extensive, good farming land and low lying and quite European, Central European uh, within its environment. Croatia itself, though, is separated by the Dinaric Alps, which then uh, run along the coastline uh, of the Adriatic from north to south. It's cutting the Adriatic coastline and the coastal plain uh, off from the inland areas and from the uh, northern area towards the Danube as well. So we have quite a, a complex uh, geological and also a, a rich farming agricultural uh, landscape separated between that northern central European temperate elements and also a Mediterranean agricultural uh, landscape along the Adriatic coastline there as well. The mountains historically always caused a barrier uh, to be between the coast and its population there and the inland areas as well. And for wider trade and connections, the sea provided the key route for traveling around the area of the peninsula, allowing access up into Central Europe, again, via the Alpine passes, which could be reached from the, the top of the Adriatic, and then down and across into Italy, uh, and also down into the Mediterranean itself with that wider access into the uh, Mediterranean uh, trading world, crossing across to Greece, along to Anatolia in the eastern direction, and across to Sicily and North Africa in the western direction as well. So the sea was always an incredibly important travel route for the populations, not just of Croatia, but of the whole Mediterranean basin. And the Mediterranean Sea very much acts as a linking uh, element uh, across the various populations and communities that surround the Mediterranean basin itself. The map of Croatia here does tend to show the current situation in terms of the neighbours that Croatia has uh, surrounding it. So to the north, uh, we have Hungary. Uh, we also have Slovenia. Uh, they're basically occupying uh, that northern Pannonian area. Uh, linking across from Slovenia, we have Italy as well, only a short distance away. And then in towards the south, we have uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, and also Serbia, and down into Montenegro. So all of these are the neighbours of the modern Croatian state, uh, which emerged out of the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1980s and the 1990s. And what we see on this map, though, is very much how we have this two areas of Croatia with the northern Pannonian area uh, bordering onto the Danube, uh, with the capital of Zagreb uh, based up there, and then this long coastal area with the Dinaric Alps separating it off from its neighbours to the east as it runs down from the north to the south um, that you can see here. So these forms part of the geological and the bordering uh, areas for Croatia. But what we also have here is the fact that the Dinaric Alps, uh, certainly for Dalmatia, which is going to be the key area that we'll be focusing on today, provides quite a limited landscape in its current form. It's largely limestone uh, cast, uh, so agricultural landscape is quite limited there, but it does support 
uh, Mediterranean style uh, crops such as olives and such as grapes uh, being grown down within this area here. And also uh, off of the coast, there is a large archipelago of over a thousand islands uh, which lie across the coast of Croatia here on this eastern side of the Adriatic. In antiquity, there is evidence for population back into the Upper Paleolithic period, so very, very early human occupation uh, within the area of modern Croatia itself. When we come into the Iron Age, we tend to find now that we have a population which is separated into a group of different tribal units, uh, not uh, a unified population, as one would not expect uh, during the early uh, Iron Age period, but with influences coming in from across the Alps, from the Celts uh, to the north, and from other groups uh, also influencing the development of the population here in the Iron Age, coming in from the south as well, the uh, area of what's now uh, Greece and Albania, where there were various Hellenistic kingdoms uh, developing during certainly the 6th uh, down into the 3rd century BC. The image that I'm showing you here shows the number of Illyrian tribes which were identified by our ancient sources uh, during particularly from the, the 5th down into the 3rd century BC. What you also see with this is that the Illyrian, these people who are known as the Illyrians, this is the wider uh, ethnic name which is given to them by our Greek and Roman sources, uh, they don't just have occupation of the area of what's now modern Croatia, but you can also see from this slide that they are found on the western side of the Adriatic in what's now Italy and all the way down along the eastern coast of Italy, certainly from the 6th, 7th century down into the Roman period, so down to the 2nd century BC, the eastern coastal area was divided up into territory of a number of Illyrian tribes. So what we have there, again, is that evidence of the Adriatic being not so much a barrier, but actually being a highway uh, for the use of not only trade and other goods, but also for populations uh, being able to move uh, across the Adriatic to extend areas in which they're living in. So what we tend to find here then are these evidence of these uh, early, of these tribal groups and what our sources also tell us is, and this is borne out by the archaeology, is that the Illyrian uh, tribes were very much developing, as one would expect that uh, cultures were doing at this time during the Iron Age. And there is evidence, certainly by the 3rd century BC, of a more centralised Illyrian state beginning to emerge down in the south of their territory, uh, bordering on to what was the Greek kingdom of Epirus uh, at that time. The culture, as it was developing, was also heavily influenced by the spread of Greek settlements along the eastern, co along the eastern coast of uh, Croatia, on that Dalmatian coast, particularly onto the islands uh, just off of the the mainland, uh, where there were a number of Greek settlements established during this period of Greek colonization, uh, which lasts down through from the, certainly from the 7th century BC uh, down into the 3rd century BC. Uh, and that also extended across into uh, Italy as well, down on the eastern and the western uh, southern coastline of the Italian peninsula. Again, this contact with the Greek world has a major impact on the development of the Illyrian societies and their cultural, uh, their, their culturalization, which takes place 
begins to show them using more and more Greek pottery, developing urban settlements and fortifying them uh, using techniques and technology, which they're copying and borrowing from the Greek world. So we have this picture of Illyria emerging in the middle of the first century BC, a middle of the first millennium BC, to then develop its cultural positioning and also becoming a bit of a threat to the Greeks in the south of the peninsula, where the Greek uh, Hellenistic kingdoms begin to go into decline in the third century BC, and the Illyrians seem to be able to take advantage of that. And there's evidence of Illyrian raiding and problems being caused by the Illyrians for the Hellenistic kingdoms in what was Epirus and then down into Macedonia uh, as well. One of the things which the Illyrians are very famous for was their control of the Adriatic during the 4th to 3rd centuries BC. Uh, the Illyrians used the Adriatic, as we sort of said, as a highway and also for the uh, transportation of goods, for trade, but also for raiding and for piracy. The Illyrians, in terms of their different tribal groups, established very, very good shipbuilding technologies and became very famous for those. And over time, seaborne Illyrian raids became more and more of a problem for not only the Greek city-states based down along the, the coast of Italy and also of uh, the south of the Balkan Peninsula down into Greece, but also for the new emerging power of Rome, uh, which had emerged out of central Italy in the 6th century BC and by the 3rd century BC was beginning to dominate uh, the south of the Italian peninsula as well and establishing new ports such as Brundisium down in the south of Italy, uh, which it was using to trade from. So Rome begins to be concerned about the Illyrians, and certainly by the first century, beginning of the first century BC, Rome is looking to curb the piracy of the uh, Illyrian ships that were dominating the Adriatic at this point. The stele here, which comes from the north of Italy, shows a ship there that you can see, which is um, being attacked by smaller boats, which lie on the, the bottom of this stele here. This seems to reflect a transport ship, uh, possibly a, a, a trireme, which is under attack from these smaller, much more maneuverable vessels, which are the type of vessels that we know that the Illyrians were building and creating, types of shipping which the Romans call the Liberna in the north of the Illyrian kingdom. There is a slightly different type, a smaller vessel uh, called the Lemboi, which was operating out from the south of the uh, Illyrian territories. Uh, but these were causing a great problem for shipping Rome then staged a number of wars in the beginning of the second century BC in order to uh, curb the threat that these were causing. This brought it into contact with an invasion into Illyria itself and then the suppression of the emerging central Illyrian state in the south, uh, but then also the Romans then deciding to begin to establish their own colonies in the second century BC on the eastern coast of, of Illyria in the area of Dalmatia. The ships, these Liburnan ships, which uh, the Illyrians mentioned uh, were well known for developing and for using, were something that the Romans themselves then copied and they begin to use themselves. This image comes from Trajan's Column, uh, which dates to the end of the 1st century AD, beginning of the 2nd century AD. And what it shows is a Roman Liburnan-type ship 
being used on a river, but the Romans were using these Liburni uh, as a backbone for its navy. And in fact, Octavian, who, as we'll see shortly, has a lot of interaction uh, and all engagement in Illyria, that Octavian then decides to use these types of small, very manoeuvrable, uh, shallow draft vessels as the backbone of his navy. And it is suggested that it was largely a Liburnian fleet, uh, probably manned with Illyrian seamen who defeated Mark Antony's navy at the Battle of Actium in 31 uh, BC, giving Octavian then control of the Roman Empire. So the Illyrian navy was very much a game changer for the Romans. During the first century BC, Rome undergoes through a period of major upheaval. It had began to establish its uh, empire during the third and the second centuries BC, but had been engaged in major overseas wars, particularly with the state of Carthage, uh, the, the Punic city based over in what's now Tunisia. Coming through that, then Rome goes into, in the first century BC, a major period of civil war, which decimates uh, the Roman aristocracy and causes absolute destruction of sites across uh, the Roman world. Um, and it then also then leads at the end of uh, the first century BC to the rise of one individual to put the Roman world back together. And this is an individual called Gaius Octavius, uh, Octavianus, as he become, became known, who was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, one of the, the great uh, Roman generals and political figures of the middle of the first century BC. Octavian is the last man standing during these great upheavals in the Roman world. And Octavian then, after his defeat of Mark Antony and the rest of any of his opponents, he needs to reinforce his military credentials and his credentials as safeguarding uh, the Roman state that he is now leading. And so one of the first things that he is involved in doing is putting down piracy in the Adriatic again. The uh, Liberna people uh, had been causing trouble and also, and so uh, Octavian decides to launch major campaigns against them in 35 to 33 BC, which then sees him, sees him taking control of the Adriatic east coast of, of Croatia. At this time as well, he also sees a threat to the north in the area of the Pannonian Basin, and he defeats then the tribal groups in that area in 34 BC, so therefore protecting the routes in towards Italy, both from the sea as well as from the land linking between Croatia and across into the north of Italy as well. So Augustus is then the name which is given to Octavian after he is confirmed in his position as the leader of the Roman state by the Roman Senate in 27 BC, and he is given this new name as Augustus, the person to lead uh, the Roman state into its revival uh, to set the state uh, back on an even keel again, and to then lead the Romans into a new prosperous future. So again, Augustus, as he is now from 27 BC onwards, the individual who is being shown here in his military guides uh, that you can see the protector of the Roman state. Augustus continues with a major set of wars in Illyria in order to extend Roman control during both the 
the rest of the first century BC. It's a pacification process which is going on in the north in Pannonia, uh, taking control of the tribes up towards the Danube area, and in the south, uh, reinforcing and establishing increased Roman control in the area of Dalmatia, uh, that area uh, bordered by the Dinaric Alps, uh, and the Adriatic. And this seems to be working quite well down to 13 BC, where he feels that he has pacified the Illyrian lands uh, and created now the province of Illyria, which includes modern Croatia. Unfortunately, Rome is very much a bit of a user empire. It's not conquering countries for the benefit of those populations that they're taking control of. Rome is after raw materials. Rome is after goods. It's after booty. It's after manpower. It's after slaves. It is therefore quite harsh upon the local populations during the initial periods of Roman control uh, being extended into new province areas. And certainly uh, Illyria suffered very much from this and from all the upheavals that the Roman world had gone through during the first century BC. This then led to a major problem uh, for Rome emerging in the early first century uh, AD, when the various tribal groups, both in Pannonia and also down in the area of the of Dalmatia, begin to uh, resent what the Romans are requiring them to do and plan a great revolt. Uh, this seems to emerge slightly separately in both areas, both though led by either an individual called Bato or by uh, possibly Bato being a royal uh, designation or a designation as a leader. So what we have in the period of the beginning of the first century AD then is then this major revolt which breaks out between 6 to 8 AD and it's suggested that well over nearly half a million of the Illyrians are involved within this revolt large elements of uh, manpower are involved within it and they take they they sort of take the Romans by surprise they initially are on raids to destroyed the Roman colonies which had been established in their territory and to take back control of their land. But it's a very uncoordinated campaign between the two groups. This gives the Romans time to regroup and to rebuild. And so what we then have during this period of time up into 9 AD then is the Roman reaction to this great uh, Illyrian revolt and the assemblage uh, under Tiberius, the adopted son of Augustus, of a large military force to go in and back and restore Roman control in the area of Illyria. <laughs> and this force uh, amounted to 15 Roman legions uh, being used and a military uh, component of certainly it's about 100,000 Roman troops involved in this campaign to retake and pacify Illyria. And so what we have then is the Roman campaign in Illyria after initial setbacks is able to retake control of the province and to to then restore Pax Romana, uh, the Roman peace within it. What we have here, just some items of Roman and Illyrian military equipment. The image on the right is an early Roman helmet of the type being worn by legionaries at this time. And the type on the left that you can see is of an Illyrian style helmet. One of the things that to bear in mind about this particular revolt was the fact that many Illyrians by this time had already been serving in Roman military forces. 
either as auxiliaries or even in some instances as legionaries. And so therefore, uh, they were aware of Roman military techniques and they were using them and able to put up uh, quite a, a major opposition uh, to uh, Rome at this time. So this uh, slide just shows areas upon which the activity was taking place and Tiberius was supported by Germanicus, the adopted son again of Augustus, the, the son of Drusus, and they were able to come back in from the north, from down from Germania, as well as other Roman forces coming in from Thrace as well, the Moesian legions, to uh, basically capture the Illyrians in a pincer movement. We've got various Roman tombstones and inscriptions from across Illyria, which shows how much of a militarized province it was in the first century AD. And so these individuals here that we can see potentially being linked to those campaigns, or certainly for the pacification process afterwards, which takes place across uh, the wider province. These are the Roman individuals involved in that campaign. So on the right hand side, we've got uh, wearing uh, a crown uh, there, we've got Tiberius, who becomes then the successor of Augustus. And we've also got Germanicus, uh, who unfortunately dies while he is governor over in Syria. Uh, but Germanicus uh, showing himself in, at this time as a major Roman uh, military figure. One of the, the rather wonderful finds linked to the Great Illyrian Revolt is this rather beautiful Carnelian gemstone, which was created to, we believe, celebrate the victory of the Roman forces over the Illyrian rebels. And on the top of it here, uh, you can see a seated Augustus being crowned by victory, holding uh, a crown over his head. Rome herself sitting next uh, to Augustus there and congratulating him. And on the left-hand side of it, you can see we have Tiberius stepping down from a chariot, which he would have used for his triumph to celebrate uh, the victory over the Illyrian rebels and the gods themselves. So we've got Zeus or Jupiter is to the Romans over on the right hand side, all there very much uh, congratulating Augustus on the successful uh, conclusion uh, to the great Illyrian revolt. The other image here shows from the base of that uh, rather fine gemstone, the troops there raising a trophy of victory. And there we've got Illyrian captives seated, dejected at the base of this, waiting to be uh, taken into slavery. So the victory of Roman arms ensured and a job well done, um, one would say, for Tiberius and Germanicus in the conclusion of the great Illyrian revolt. However, one of the individuals who'd been fighting on the Roman side during this revolt as a cavalry captain and leader of German auxiliary troops was an individual called Arminius. And Arminius, who was also known as Hermann uh, in later German mythology, was a prince of the Carusi, uh, one of the German tribes that was allied to Rome. And he saw that Rome really had very nearly uh, lost control of the situation in Illyria. And so on his return to Germany and his return to his tribe, he then instigates uh, a major uh, revolt on the eastern side of the Rhine and lures the Roman governor of the province of Germania, Quintilius Varus, into the Teutonberger Wold, where he then completely destroys Varus's army of three Roman legions. And this brings the Roman expansion, which was being planned from the Rhine across into the Elbe, 
to a halt and very much changes the disposition of the borders of the Roman Empire. So the Great Illyrian Revolt might well have failed in terms of its overall attempt, but it inspired other uh, attempts to free themselves from the Roman world, uh, as with Armianus and the German revolt of 9 AD. After this period of time, uh, we see that during the High Roman Empire, that's a period of the first and second centuries AD, that Illyria is divided into two areas. Uh, to the north, Pannonia, uh, bordering on to the uh, Danube, and with Sirmium, there as one of its major centres, and then Dalmatia itself, particularly down towards the coastal area, with its capital of Salona down on the coast there that you can see on this image. What we had then that takes place during this high empire period, and particularly during the first century AD uh, in Illyria, is a major process of Romanization. So we've got Roman colonies established and Roman citizens based there, also including ex-military and the locals uh, in terms of the leaders of the different Illyrian communities are then encouraged to partake in becoming Roman and gaining the benefits of being part of the Roman world. And in order to encourage them to do this, there was the expansion of the cult of the Roman emperors. So these local tribal hierarchies and aristocracies were encouraged to become priests of the imperial cult and to proclaim their loyalty to the Roman world uh, through their honouring the emperor, both living emperors and their deceased ancestors. One of the very, very fine monuments surviving from the early Augustan period in Croatia is this temple which is located in Pula and is a temple which is dedicated to Rome and Augustus and dates to sometime between 27 BC uh, and AD 14 and the type of temple it is is very much an italic roman style temple so it's on a high podium and certainly we know who it was dedicated to uh, because of the inscription you can just see some of the uh the lettering up on the top of it there where the original bronze lettering would have been fixed in on the tablature of the pediment to uh, proclaim the deity that the temple is being used for and this very much tells us it's dedicated to rome and to augustus the son of the deified julius caesar so very much this process of honoring the emperors as a proclamation of loyalty was something that was expected and was used during the, the roman period what we then also have is then at sites such as at Nîmes, uh, a little bit to the uh, north of Zada, also in this area. Again, statues of the Roman emperors were found in the 19th century, uh, linked again to one of these Augustarium, these imperial cult buildings. On the left-hand side, you can see an image there again of Augustus, this is after he's died in AD 14 and he become deified. And we can see that he's that this is an image of him after he's died because he's not wearing a tunic under his toga. He is shown bare chested, much as the god Jupiter uh, would have been. So this is very much sort of indicating that the emperor has now become a god and to be honored and worshipped. And next to him, there you can also see another statue from this cult site where we have Tiberius, his successor, being shown and Tiberius there wearing a tunic under his toga but also uh, with the toga over his head to show that he is engaged in offering prayers for the well-being of the Roman state. Another site where these one of these Augustarium uh, survives is down at Nanona down in the south of the Dalmatian Peninsula. And here 
what we have is uh, a site in which <laughs> when it was discovered in the 20th century then the excavation of it which was on the site of a former pigsty uh, i believe uh, linked to a farm the site of it was fully excavated and it was decided to build a museum on the site and to display the statues and the remains of the building itself on the site where it had been excavated so here we see this wonderful group uh, and i won't go into who, who all of them are but a group of the who's who of the roman world of the first and early second century a.d the whole of the imperial family uh, that we can see there shown on this plinth which surrounded the central altar uh, which lies in the front of this image there that you can see. And again, local aristocrats, local magistrates encouraged to come and show their loyalty to the state through the worship of the imperial family. This is a reconstruction to show the temple complex there that we found on that site. And this would have been very much the center of this cult uh, again, in a, a large site at Monona, which was also a major Roman area of control, dominating down in the south of the Dalmatian province. Elsewhere, other buildings were created and built during the first century AD in order to encourage the adoption of Romanitas by the local populations. Uh, again, to reinforce loyalty to the state, but to encourage people to take part in the activities that were essential for the Roman world. So bath complexes, bathing and all the like uh, that we can see. And also the great amphitheatre here at Pula, one of the best surviving amphitheatres from the Roman world, which dates to the Julio-Claudian period. So this period of time between the year, ten, uh, year 27 BC uh, down into uh, 68 AD for its initial construction, but then with additional developments in the Flavian period, particularly under the Emperor Titus, where underground rooms were added to the complex as well. The seating population in this amphitheatre was probably about uh, 23,000 people, making it one of the larger uh, amphitheatres in the Roman world. At Zada, there is the evidence of a large Roman forum complex that we're looking down onto here with later medieval buildings placed onto it. Some of those I'll come back to shortly. But this contained the Basilica Law Courts, the main temple complexes, as well as bath complexes and shops. And Zada, an ancient uh, Iada, an important Roman centre. And again, this process of Romanization goes all the way through it. In the third century AD, the Roman world gets into problems. And so there is a collapse of the Roman state, uh, which takes place between 238 AD down to uh, about 284 AD. The emperors who pull this back together, this Roman state back together again to restore the empire were largely all drawn from uh, the Illyrian provinces. So on the top row of images, we have the Emperor Claudius the Goth that we can see there, who reigned during the 260s AD, Aurelian, the great emperor who reunites the empire after uh, its divisions of the 3rd century AD, we can see in the centre, and then also Probus up onto the top there, and then uh, the Emperor Diocletian, the man who fully restores the state uh, in the two, uh, 280s AD. And then uh, next to him, we have two other Illyrian emperors on the bottom there, Constantius Chlorus uh, and his son, Constantine, who then is the person who undoes all of the work which Diocletian did to create a stable succession plan for the Roman world through appointed successors to the key emperors. The system which Diocletian introduced as illustrated in this uh, rather fine statue which is now to be seen in Venice 
who was originally in Constantinople and was taken from there in 1204 AD is the statue so-called of brotherly love, which is an image of what we call the Tetrarchy. These four uh, senior figures, two emperors and their two designated successors, Caesars, who are the leadership of the Roman state as devised by Diocletian to create an orderly succession following on from the destruction of the third century AD uh, crisis. And the Tetrarchy, which lies certainly from 293 down to about 324 AD, saw the Roman Empire being divided into two main halves, each with a senior Augustus, one in the west, one in the east, and each of those having their own deputy or their Caesars who will take over from them after they step down. Unfortunately for Diocletian, he has to retire early from uh, his duties as emperor because of ill health, it would seem. And he decided to step down and is the only Roman emperor to actually retire from the job. He had built for himself a great retirement palace at Split near to Salona in Dalmatia. And this image shows the modern historic centre of Split, which is built over the site of his retirement palace. Probably palace itself and the complex of which is part of was originally being built as a Roman military and materials base uh, for the development for the production of textiles. But the need for a retirement home for Diocletian made them change the plan for that. Diocletian comes from the area near Salona. He wanted to retire to where he uh, originally came from. And so the building that we complex that we see at Split now was then created to allow this the retirement palace to be built for the emperor. Here we can see a reconstruction of it and the image there that we have of the plan on the bottom as well shows the layout. It's in the form of a military Roman camp uh, laid out with a cardo running between the east and the west, major road, uh, and a decumanus also running through it as well and separated between official barracks for troops and for the staff to uh, look after Diocletian, the northern side of the site and also on the, the eastern side of the site, while on the western side we have the living accommodation for the emperor himself. The site itself very much shows the grandeur of uh, a Roman palace of the late 3rd, early 4th century AD. This is a great peristyle that lies in the heart of the complex with the great porch there, the great portico leading up into the entrance to the emperor's private quarters down at the far end. And also linking within all of this on either side of the peristyle, buildings uh, such as a temple to Jupiter and then what we see here is the mausoleum, the funerary monument for Diocletian and what would have been his resting place originally and this is very much in tradition of uh, late Roman emperors in terms of building their tombs within uh, their palace structures in various areas. Unfortunately the Roman recovery under Diocletian doesn't last very long. It is upset by another one of the Illyrian emperors, Constantine the Great, who then reunites the empire and it then is continued on under his family initially and the idea of a designated successor falls away again and Rome uh, enters into a period of decline during the late 4th and the 5th centuries AD which then sees uh, a period of time in which Germanic people, the Ostrogoths, take control before of a reconstruction uh, under uh, the Emperor Justinian I from the city of Constantinople. And just to finish on the last couple of slides to very much sort of indicate that 
uh, link with Constantinople and Justinian's reconquest of the area of the Croatian coast, particularly in the area of Dalmatia, as part of his reconquests of the 6th century AD. And this is at the site of Porek, where the great Euphrasian church, Basilican church, was built to honour the Virgin Mary and her Assumption. Uh, and again, this dates into the middle years of the 6th century AD uh, and is very much a Basilican church in the style of churches that were being constructed in places such as Ravenna, in terms of and Constantinople, and also the sites in North Africa, which were being refurbished by Justinian, who involved in this major uh, phase of church building during the period of the resettlement of these provinces after their conquest by Justinian's forces. And at the Euphrasian Chapel, we see here this image of Christ in heaven. They're seated on the throne, surrounded by the apostles, shown as a Roman young individual. And then below in the uh, apse of the dome, we have, first of all, the Lamb of God being shown up in the center of it. But then we have the Virgin Mary holding the Christ uh, child in her hands. They're seated again on uh, the heavenly throne and with a crown being handed down from God on high. And we also have the various saints and angels on either side of the Virgin there, including, you can see on the left there, the Euphrasius himself, who is carrying a model of his church, which he's handing over to the Virgin. So in this talk, what I wanted to sort of indicate is that we've had this culture of the population of Illyria, which has been overtaken by Rome and which then has become Romanized after its forced subjugation into the Roman world. That's Romanization process and links between Dalmatia and the Roman world continue on down into the early medieval period and it's continuing on under Justinian and the later Byzantine emperors. We have sites like this one at Zada, the great church of St. Donat Donatus, uh, originally again a church dedicated to the this one, the Holy Trinity in uh, Zada there which links between both the Byzantine world and also the world of the Carolingian Empire expanding out of the central European uh, landmass. Elements of it which are Byzantine include very much the, the round shape, which again uh, we do find in the West, but again that was copied from Byzantine prototypes, and also the upper women's chap that you can see there uh, up onto the top of the... Um, balcony uh, there over the ground floor of the, the church itself. The introduction of new peoples coming in in terms of the, the Slavs uh, changed very much the population of this area in both parts of the former Roma provinces during the 8th and the 9th centuries AD. What we've got here is a, a horn antler item which is decorated with an image of a tree of life see there and two deer one on either side of it very much coming out of this new slavic people uh, the croats who arrived down in this area at this time and very much it still remains within the area of byzantine and then the venetian control which again still does contain links back to constantinople uh, through certainly the 12th into the 16th and 17th centuries where the population does still maintain these very very strong links with venice in the north which uh, was a successor in many ways to uh, the byzantine state uh, in the central european area and also to constantinople and sites such as dubrovnik you see here which very much survived and prospered during the medieval period its original name ragusa that survives as a city-state down on the coast between east and west and this was how 
uh, in the medieval period, these Dalmatian communities very much survived either under Venetian control or, as with uh, Ragusa here, as a site which sits in between major powers and acted as a go-between for each of them and as a key trading body, surviving by playing each of the key uh, powers surrounding it off in its own right. So thank you very much for bearing with me with that run-through of the Roman and then the Byzantine influences onto Croatia, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. That was a most interesting talk, and I'm sure everyone like me learned an enormous amount. Great. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Tony? Thank you. No, that was fascinating. Thank you. I didn't know any of it, really. I particularly like that object with all the people on it under the other. Yeah, the Gemma Augusta. Know, what was it? Because the faces were beautiful. It was just fantastic. It's basically there was a, an art form that was very, very popular in the certainly in the early Roman Empire period. The creation of cameos, uh, basically uh, a form of gemstone design, which used all sorts of different materials within it. Of that one is made of a particular type of stone, which has those two colours, which were able to be uh, combined through its cutting. So gemstone uh, manufacture, very, very highly regarded during the early Roman Empire period. It's yeah. actually held now in, the, in one of the museums in Vienna. Yeah. So if you want to see it, sadly, that's where you'll need to go. How big is it? In terms of size, it's actually fairly small. It's, um, it's probably about sort of four or five inches yeah. across. Yeah. Uh, so they're very, very delicate pieces thank you okay thanks tony yeah. any other questions for tony collection of statues around that courtyard that was dug up and turned into a museum i yeah. was wondering why they none of them had their heads were the heads stolen at some previous time or smashed off or what was the story there i was hoping somebody was going to ask me that so yes in terms of heads i think there's there's two things with that one is roman statuary is often composite so it was made in different pieces of stone so often you will find the main part of the body is made as, as from one piece and then the heads and the arms uh, are a separate pieces of stone often using different coloured stones sometimes to, to enhance the images as well. One of the reasons why the heads uh, were missing from so many of those is that in the early Christian period, the statues themselves were seen to be uh, inhabited by evil spirits. And so one of the things that the early Christians do after Christianity takes control of the Roman Empire, certainly in the late 4th century AD, is that the Christians go around knocking off the heads of statues. A lot of them actually then also get um, rent put into lime kilns and turned into building material. But certainly the heads were often taken away. And probably one might argue that the, the statues are sort of almost being ritually killed and destroyed. Interestingly with the site there is that some of the, the heads were found not too far away and in fact both of them ended up, I suppose I ought to be embarrassed by this, but in collections in the UK, British uh, collection, particularly in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. One of those has been returned and is now restored back to its former body and in the museum there whereas another uh, head of the Roman Empress, Livia, actually still remains at the Ashmolean in Oxford. So, but yeah, ritual removal of those is, in th this instance, the main uh, reason why that they uh, were taken probably during the Christian period. Thank you. It's fascinating. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been a most interesting evening. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Tony, for a wonderful talk. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.